2012 was a great year for movies, offering a ton of variety. These are all the movies that I saw last year, and this list is 10 of my favorites. So let's go. Ten. Ben Affleck as a director is building a great body of work, as Argo, like the town, is a wonderfully executed story. And it's only made better by the fact that it's actually true. The CIA posing as a movie production to rescue hostages from Iran just sounds crazy on paper, but it actually happened. And in fitting fashion, this amazing story has a slew of great actors in it. I mean, I could watch Alan Arkin and John Goodman's characters all day. Spin-off movie. Spin-off movie. Also giving an excellent performance, as per usual, is Brian Cranston. Although I must admit, every time that he angrily slammed down the phone, I just was thinking, Damn it, Jesse! Or Reese, or Dewey, or Francis, or Malcolm. Gosh, I miss Malcolm in the middle. But these great performances suffer when there's no arc for the characters. Like, the biggest arc anyone has is just their conversation and being convinced to do it. So how do you propose we do this? This crazy idea. I don't know about that. It'll work. I'm on board. But considering how fast the story has to move, I completely understand this choice. And man, does this story clip along. The editing is absolutely superb. Now loop that in with some fantastic cinematography, and you've got the quick-witted, fast-paced drama with a crazy premise that Argo set out to be and proves to be crazy good. Nine. The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey is a unique breed as it was written first, so it isn't quite a salmon box, although it's being treated as such to make it tie in more closely with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. But honestly, I don't mind, because I'm just happy to be back in Middle Earth. And I get to be questing with dwarves and Martin Freeman as we go take on Benedict Cumberbatch. Guys, I really can't wait for series three of Sherlock. It's gonna be real good. I mean, Martin Freeman is perfect casting as Bilbo as he plays put upon so well. And of course, to counter Bilbo as a straight man, the dwarves offer a fun variety of personalities. All Snow White aside. But even with the movie being as long as it is, you only really walk out knowing a handful of dwarves. The rest I still confuse with one another. Although that might be just because I'm dwarf racist. That said of all the dwarves, while I'm sure by the end of the story my favorite will be Thorin, at the present moment it's Killy. He just has this universal best friend quality to him. And being such a pretty boy, he'll probably also get a fragrance named after him. With all the sensual nature of Mirkwood, Killy. And if you want to smell like musky cheese, Mom. But in terms of Hobbit in action, the film does wonderfully in moving us out of the frying pan and into the fire. However, there's never really a sense of danger, as J.R.R. Tolkien frequently deus ex machina us as out of action sequences in Middle Earth. Oh man, things are looking real dire. Good thing the writers of Rohan or ghosts or eagles showed up. Like, you didn't earn those eagles. Or were the eagles just like hanging out and being like, yeah man, we're majestic or whatever. Oh, there's like a bunch of battles going on. Yeah, I guess we haven't seen action in a while. Swoop. I will say though, as The Hobbit was initially written as a kid's fantasy adventure, the action sequences do tend to feel a little more goofy at times. However, I still think we have more decapitations in this than all of Lord of the Rings. But while we may have a few uneven ideas in The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey, it's still fantastic to be reunited with familiar places and faces. Cause you know your favorite scene was Riddles in the Dark with Gollum. Andy Serkis is just too good. And Howard Shore continues to provide this majestic score that's blending old and new themes. The film just does a great job in stitching the Middle Earth universe together. And for that, I'm excited for Desolation of Smog and here and back again, cause Middle Earth is always a good time. Eight. A more can be summed up in two words, emotionally devastating. The story is about a couple in their 80s and what happens when the wife has a stroke. If you've lost a grandparent or parent or seen someone slowly deteriorate to Alzheimer's, this film is gonna hit home for you. Camera placement and editing is very patient. Simple actions like the husband helping her walk are so sad and yet romantic. It, it, makes you well up, because he loves her so much, and she him. If you're looking for a good time, this is definitely not the movie for you. Add on top of that that this is in French, so you do have to read. But even if you weren't to look at the subtitles, these performances translate. Amour shows that love doesn't need to be this Hollywood story of fireworks, but it's staying with someone you love until the very end. It's a somber film, but a touching one. Seven. The Raid Redemption is one heck of a badass film, and it knows it. A crime lord lives at the very top of a building, and that building houses all the criminals that work for the crime lord. The police go in to get that crime lord, and the crime lord sticks all the criminals on the police. And it's with that simple setup that the Raid Redemption very quickly blows you away. It's easily among the ranks of other great martial arts films such as Drunken Master, Ong Bak, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. From explosions to guns to fistfights to martial arts, it might not have something as iconic as that stairwell scene from The Protector, but Holy heck, that door kill. Oof. It's testosterone on steroids, which I don't think is really a thing. But here's the really cool part. I went in thinking that the raid was just going to be a bunch of brutal action, and I wound up connecting with these characters a lot more than I expected. For as crazy varied and action-packed as the movie is, characters are very well-defined and not just killing machines. And the story is smart in nesting personal conflict in that complex of havoc, making those final fights that much more supercharged. So hats off to you, the raid. Your 30 stories of awesome. 
Six. Django Unchained is a fantastic racially charged 70s inspires revenge cowboy con film. Tarantino definitely likes creating his own genres, but hey man, that's okay because Django Unchained is a great time. The story revolves around Jamie Foxx's character Django being freed by Christoph Waltz's character Dr. King Schultz, who masquerades as a dentist but is actually a bounty hunter. And Schultz, being one who frowns upon slavery, frees Django and then they soon partner up. And the duo take a break from bounty hunting to seek out and free Django's wife. Now you have to understand that Quentin Tarantino is a stellar writer. All of his characters are very well crafted, but it's with his villains that he is head and shoulders above the rest. He manages to make them magnetic and yet repulsive at the same time. This was the case with Christoph Walton and Glorious Bastards, and it is equally true with Leonardo DiCaprio and Django. From Southern Smolder to Ferocious Hellfire, DiCaprio is an amazing villain. I'd go so far to say that this is his best performance to date, and DiCaprio is coupled so well with Samuel L. Jackson's character, who plays the Uncle Tom of the Candyland Plantation, making them both just so despicable. So in case you couldn't tell, every scene holds your attention as it's a wonderful game of cat and mouse and silver tongue devilry. And of course, being a Tarantino film, there's a ton of ultra-violent, hyper-stylized action, and in many cases punctuates some of these awesome exchanges, making Django Unchained an absolute blast. Five. The Avengers was, without a doubt, the popcorn movie of 2012. It was everybody's favorite Marvel superheroes coming together. However, not Spider-Man because Sony Pictures is that. Or the X-Men because that's Fox. And not Ant-Man or Wasp. But even with a few missing from the roster, The Avengers was a great time at the movies. It had a really fun TV-inspired cold open, because, you know, it's Joss Whedon, so yeah. And when the team comes together, that third act is absolute dynamite. My only one major gripe is that some of the pairings could have been changed up a little bit. But we are dealing with an ensemble superhero movie. That would be like faulting Love Actually for not having Alan Rickman and Liam Neeson interact. They were a row apart, and yet they never acknowledge that a Jedi and a wizard are in the auditorium. I mean, seriously, we all just want to see Snape go up against Qui-Gon Jinn, right? I mean, it's just fan service. And that's what the Avengers did so well. It showed up for the fans. We got a slew of great interactions, and its subsequent sequels will surely enrich those relationships and offer a ton of more awesome moments. Like a chocolate cake scene, or a musical number. Hey, it's not that crazy. Joss Whedon likes his singing. Four. Beast of the Southern Wild is a very difficult title to pronounce. That S and the TH. There's a reason that Beasts of the Southern Wild did as well as it did at Sundance. It's a truly magical film. The story revolves around a young girl, Hush Puppy, and her father, Wink. They live in a region known as the Bathtub, which is just south of Louisiana. And we see this Katrina-inspired story through the eyes of Hush Puppy. And to be viewing this disaster and the story of survival through a child's eyes, it's just a touch of brilliance. There's a whimsical quality to this earthy film, helped by aesthetics and a phenomenal score. Like, the main theme is this triumphant swell of human spirit. The whole film has been excellently crafted by writer-director Ben Zeitlin, who purposefully cast first-time actors Quivenjene Wallace and Dwight Henry as the daughter and father. And the chemistry between these two is organic, believable, and absolutely astonishing. Also astonishing, now that they accept proper nouns, if you drop Quivenjene on a Scrabble board, boom, game over. But the game is far from over for Beasts of the Southern Wild, as this indie film deserves every bit of your attention. Three. With Indie Game the Movie, it doesn't matter if you've never played a video game before. If you have done anything mildly creative at any point, this movie will hit you on some level. So to all of you robots who have enslaved us and are now watching this in the future, this one's not for you. Oh, and P.S. Robots, you suck. This documentary charts the progress of three indie games and their developers. We're talking about teams of only one or two people, so everything really does rest on them. And we see that the makers of Braid, Fez, and Super Meat Boy are all making these games for very different reasons. You'll find yourself emotionally invested with these developers, as some incredibly trying moments are captured. And for me at least, Indie Game the Movie is incredibly inspiring creatively. I mean, it's showing how a person with passion and drive can make something truly unique. I mean, the fact that technology allows one person to make a video game is insane to me. And so I'm incredibly impressed by the developers and the movie. Because man, it'll reignite your creative flame if it's growing dim. Two. Moonrise Kingdom is just so damn delightful and has Wes Anderson's charm and humor all over it. As far as his filmography goes, I'd say it hovers around Rushmore and Life Aquatic for me. And as far as the overall ranking goes, I guess it goes a little something like this. Yeah, I know, a list in a list. But don't you dare write Listception in the comments. That joke is two years old and from an etymology standpoint, it doesn't even make sense. Moonrise Kingdom follows two young lovers who no one else seems to understand their love. You see, with Moonrise Kingdom, it seems to be the youth who truly understand what love is, where every other adult seems to have their relationship in shambles. And as always, Anderson has created this wonderful world peppered with off-kilter characters and jokes. Ooh, this is good. Just imagine if Wes Anderson World was like this kitschy amusement park. 60s-inspired music would be playing all the time, only precocious kids would be allowed in, and there'd be a ride that only runs in slow motion. And while sadly such an amusement park doesn't exist, we'll always have our tunnel of love 
in Moonrise Kingdom. One. Now I know it's a little cheap to make this comparison, but take every positive thing that I've said about Argo and multiply it by 10, and you've got zero dark 30. Hey, it totally checks out when you cross multiply. Hell, it even blows Catherine Bigelow's previous work, The Hurt Locker, out of the water. And that thing won an Oscar. Although honestly, 2009 was a weird year for the Oscars. Like to say Hurt Locker and Avatar were the two best contenders, I feel like that was really just a publicity thing because Bigelow and Cameron used to be married. We gotta sensationalize the Oscars. Give them some drama, a reason to watch. And that character is definitely anachronistic for 2009. The story of Zero Dark Thirty is the manhunt for Osama Bin Laden, headed up by Jessica Chastain. And I have to say, Jessica Chastain, you are doing everything right. And I'm not just talking about in this movie, every time every performance. And in the past two years, she's played opposite several esteemed Hollywood heavy hitters. But she's like, yeah, it's cool that you got all that acting swagger and whatever, but I'm Jessica Chastain and I'm bringing the heat. <laughs> I have no idea what that was. Phenomenal, impassioned, three-dimensional characters. And across the board in Zero Dark Thirty, the characters feel very fleshed out, making this manhunt that much more interesting. And remarkably, for as Team America as this could have gone, Zero Dark Thirty doesn't seem to have any political agenda. It's putting its characters and story first. And while the chronicling of this manhunt is long, it's engaging the entire time. Zero Dark Thirty has great performances, excellent camera work, fantastic editing, this building slow burn tension that just pulls you in. The Hurt Locker was good, but this is Catherine Bigelow's masterpiece. So those were my top 10 of 2012. And I'm sure your top 10 is different, so leave that in the comments below. And of course, if you want, you can check out previous reviews or follow me on any of them social networking sites, or even save $10 on a MoviePass subscription. The links and promo codes are in the description, so comment and click and keep loving movies, guys. As for me, well, no bits. I just wanted to thank you all for a great 2012, and here's to a fantastic 2013. There's no drink in my hand. I just look foolish.